I would like to say uh, thank you very much for speaking today. I'm going to run through our optic technology, which is our proprietary technology in bio, and how we hope to transform the drug discovery, research, and cell therapy space with our technology addressing some of the bottlenecks that currently exist. So we have a cell problem. Currently, for drug discovery and research and development, we rely on commercialized cell lines, where we can get hold of them, primary cells from humans, but also in vivo models. But the problem is with the immortalized cell lines and the in vivo models, they don't always recapture that recapitulate human disease. Now, for drug discovery, the closest we can get to human disease when we're assessing new molecules and compounds and therapeutics, the better. But also alongside, we have this third generation of therapeutics, cells as therapeutics, and they share a common problem. Both of these need access to reliable human cells to work, but we have fundamental barriers in the accessibility to these reliable cells, and that is precision, speed, and scale. So we have a need to improve the methodologies that we have to manufacture human cells. Now, primary cells and the current methods of deriving non-primary cells face several challenges. We need them to be scalable. We need the culture periods to be short, which will help reduce the cost of effects. We need higher purity, and we need, and we need to address these if we want to tackle areas such as cell therapy. Now, with the cell therapy avenues available at the moment, the big one is immunotherapy, immunotherapy for mainly immuno-oncology. And currently the only available therapeutics in the market are the autologous car C cell. But the adopted cellular therapy in the space of immuno-oncology is ever expanding, it's huge. And with the um, other approaches using utilizing other immune cells such as the phages and NK cells, those processes have also helped to highlight some of the manufacturing bottlenecks that are existing and emerging depending on the cell type that we're using. For instance, your CAR team, they're very easily accessible. You can take them from the patient blood. You can multiply them to expand them to get the numbers you need to reinfuse. That does lead to some limitations, but that can't always be applied to the other cell types that we can get within the human space as well. So you have limitations to the current and the oncology therapy And they can be cell fitness if you're deriving the cells from the patient. You can have donor donor variability, you can have issues with the expansion, but you can also have a negative impact on your final product. You can have issues with scale up, issues with where and how you can edit. You can even by your editing approaches depending on the cell type that you're using. But in comparison to other cell types that you can get hold of, the immune cells in general, or the, some of them, are a lot easier to get uh, hold of because they are a current risk. But the bottleneck highlighted here, the complexity increases at the manufacturing level when we start to look at cellular therapies for regenerative medicine. Now, the cells that you would want to go after, such as a lot of the companies are beginning to go after at the moment, are pancreatic cells or pancreatic islets, type 1 diabetes treatment, dopaminergic neurons for Parkinson, and the list goes on. But the issue with these is they're not as readily accessible as the immune cells. You can't stimulate them to proliferate in a way that you can with a T cell. And the culture and the maintenance of those is also restricted. So we need to figure out ways to make the accessibility to these cells better and the manufacturing process and the health of these cells better. And one approach to limit some of the issues that we see, at least for the immune cells, is a allogeneic cell therapy. Not only does it reduce your cost of goods, because you can have one donor to use any donors, um, but it does make it a little bit more accessible and you can have a better control over what you have, but you are still limited. Yes, the immune cells are more readily available um, where you can access them, but you still have to expand them. You still have to stimulate them and you're still in a limitation depending on what you're handling in the editing space as well. And you do need to edit these cells more heavily because they are not self when they go in as a therapeutic. And how can we solve this problem? <laughs> well, with IPSC, so induced pluripotent stem cells. So in the last 15 years, more and more companies and researchers are beginning to use the IPSCs to generate pretty much any cell type that they can in vitro because the IPSCs have that potential. And it can help to address some of the bottlenecks we see with the immune cells, because 
These are proliferated cells. We can examine these cells at the IPSC stage. We can also edit them at the IPSC stage, so we don't have to worry as much about trying to introduce edits at that final cell type where we might be restricted. But the real nice avenue that you can go down with the IPSCs is cells that are difficult to obtain and access, this makes it easier to generate those cells in the dish. And the companies that are looking at these for regenerative medicine are developing these cells from IPS. And then you have the benefit of one donor, many recipients, which helps reduce the cost of this and you get with your autologous cell therapy. So IPSCs, yes, yeah, so <laughs> but they also have their limitations. So how do we generate cells or mature cells from IPSCs currently? What are the current technologies available? So we have two approaches. The first one is the traditional approach with directed differentiation. Now this tries to recapitulate the developmental process in a dish. It is a long, expensive, or can be expensive depending on the cell type that you're making. It's growth factor driven, and you have to give certain cues and different growth factors and cytokines at each step. So it makes it long, it makes it expensive. It also results in low purity, which also affects your scalability, and it's long. It can take up to 70 days to generate the cell that you're interested in. So what is coming up more and more recently is trying to speed this process up by taking the code, so transcription factors associated with that final cell type, plugging that code into the IPSC, um, through transaction or transduction, transduction approaches and sort of turbocharging that differentiation process. And this speeds everything up because you're giving the IPSCs the transcription factors associated with that final cell type. It helps to increase your purity, but the issue is you get silencing. And that silencing affects your ability to scale up because you're going to still have a, a mixed bag of cell types within that differentiation process. So what do we do at the bio and how do we work with IPSC? So we do IPSC directed reprogramming and we have a cell identity coding platform that exists of two pillars. Our first pillar is our discovery platform where we identify those transcription factors or that code associated with the final cell type that we're interested in. And once we've identified that code, we plug that into our proprietary technology, Optiox, and use that to reprogram IPSC any cell type of interest cell therapy applications and research tools. And how does that benefit from the other two processes? Well, with the Optiox technology, we can eradicate the transcription factor silencing. And with this, we can increase the purity, reduce the biological noise, which then in turn means that we can scale this up and we still have the benefits of the shorter culture period. So we can generate ourselves within days using this process. And with that, we can hopefully make the target cell type work consistently at scale. So what is Optiox and how does it work? So Optiox is optimized inducible overexpression. And to, and to achieve that sort of stable expression of our transcription factors, we do a dual genomics and carbon targeting with the transcription factors in our Optiox step. And here's just an example of showing that when we induce the expression of our transcription factors with our text systems, so adopt the cycle inducible system, we show that we have a homogeneous expression of GFP, which is not present when we have that system off. And with that, we can control the expression of transcription factors, converting our IPSC into our cell type of interest. And here's just a nice video showing the differentiation of IP, the reprogramming of IPSCs into our glutamatergic neurons. And we hope and we use these cells for research drug discovery toxicology, which is the main avenue that we have running at the moment. We can make enhanced cells for cell therapy and enhanced cells for biomanufacturing. And these are some of the cell types that we have in development or available for off-the-shelf research and development at the moment. We have skeletal myocytes and the glutamatergic neurons and the mice that are readily available. We have our gabinergic neurons, which are now um, ready for early release testing. And the other cell types we have are in development. But we also have disease models based on our wild type cells that we're developing. So our skeletal myocytes, there's a Duchenne muscular dystrophy disease model. For our glutamatergic neurons, we have quantum disease models. And we aim to generate disease models with the other cell types that we also have in our catalog. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit um, more about one of our new cells that we have developed to help exemplify some of the characteristic traits that we have with that cell type and how it is beneficial for the therapeutic space and the product space of research and development. So we have microglia. So these are your tissue resident macrophages of the PNS. They play a key role in homeostasis. They are the first responders to any insult in the brain, and they also play a role in the development. And if we look at it from a uh, tumor perspective, like macrophages that you find elsewhere, they will also play a role in tumor progression as well. And with our technology, we've taken that transcription factor code associated with microphere, plug that into our Optiox technology, into an IPSC, and within days, we can generate nice looking microglia with the ramified morphology and the key marker expression of P12Y12 and P12Y9. And we go further on to characterize this cell. So this is all on the crack reserve product that we, that we produce for our product for off-the-shelf research and development uses. Um, by flow cytometry, we can see we have a really nice purity of 98.7% of CD14 and CD5 expression, along with the key markers of TMM119 and as well as well. We see that with our technology, we can develop uh, microglia that express further key markers, such as IBM1, a key macrophage marker, and also they have that really nice ramified morphology. But on top of that, at this final stage, in comparison to their IPSC, so the three independent batches, you don't see any expression of your chloropotency markers in that final cell type in comparison to the undifferentiated IPSC starting period. So between batches, we get a nice, consistent, pure population of microglia that no longer have that chloropotency marker expression. And we further validate all of our products that we develop in-house with uh, single cell sequencing as well to confirm the purity, to confirm subpopulations. So this is an example of the developmental process in our programming, taking five points of the programming process. So one at our IPSC stage, one at the mid-range, which we call microglia progenitors on here, and then a final time point, which is our microglia. Now, as soon as we get past the IPSC stage, we see a loss of pluripotency markers, and also we see that there isn't any expression of uh, MAT2, which is a hand neuron marker. But we can see that the key microglia markers are mainly enriched within that microglia population, again, highlighting the purity and consistency that we see with our reprogramming methods at a single cell level. We also look at batch to batch consistency with bulk RNA seq so for each dot here, these are three independent batches. We have our IPSC here, our cells post-thaw. If you were to handle the cells as a product, we have a 24-hour post-thaw stage here. And then the final time point when the microglia are ready to use are here. And you can see that each batch clusters very, very nicely together on the CA top. And we also compare our microglia to the first mean available native pot for uh, primary and human microglia. And we can see that our microglia here cluster quite nicely to other IPSC available microglia on the market and human and people microglia. So we can show batch to batch consistency at a bulk RNA seq level with our microglia and that they match and cluster nicely within range to publicly available data as well. But it's not just that. We functionally test ourselves and we functionally test ourselves as part of our QC because without function, What's the point? So we do a phagocytosis assay with the microglia, and here is showing two independent batches um, after treatment with a frodo labeled E. coli particle where you get fluorescence when the E. coli particles are in, um, internalized by phagocytosis by the microglia. So roughly you get 80% or 0.8 portion of the population that are phagocytosis in the microglia in comparison to the cytocalcin inhibitor, which will inhibit the which inhibits the phagocytosis process. And you can see that you get nice consistency between the two batches. We've also looked at phagocytosis of apoptotic cells with these. So this is just a flow plot showing the proportion of apoptotic cells that went into the assay. It's roughly 25.5%. We label these as a prototype. And the cells progressing here right, means that, that um, the microglia have uptaken apoptotic cells, which then fluoresce very much taken up. So we can show that we can phagocytose apoptotic cells and we get phagocytosis with batch-to-batch -batch 
its function there with batch to batch that we make for our microbiome. And we also can show that for pro inflammatory cytokines. So, one of the key um, functions is to produce a pro inflammatory cytokine so it's stimulated. And we see that we get nice, consistent production of IL 6, TNF alpha, IL 1B, and IL 12 in response to stimulus with LPS and the E. So, we have batch to batch consistency, not only with phenotype, with sequencing data, but also with function. And we can further show this consistency across the other cell types within our catalog. So our skeletal myocytes, for instance, we have five independent batches, and we can see consistency across the board for the myogenic markers at each batch for our skeletal myocytes. We can also show this loss of pluripotency markers and upregulation of myogenic markers by PPCR. Again, batch to batch consistency with those skeletal myocytes. But also with our glutamatergic neurons, we have two PCA plots that have covered the differentiation process, taking samples of independent replicates at each time point. And we can see that each replica clusters very nicely together, again, highlighting the consistency, but also highlighting the consistency between two clones and two different users' university image of it by discovery. Um, at each time point, we have a similar profile. So there is consistency with the reprogramming and there is consistency between batches. And we have further interrogated this with the glutamatergic neurons. So roughly each batch of manufactured cells is about a billion, which also helps to highlight the scale that we can produce cells. And this is not a limiting factor. We probably go a lot higher than this. We just don't have bioreactors to test that yet. Um, but between uh, two independent clones, three batches, three independent users as well, we can see that at each stage, we get nice clustering between the independent batches, showing to highlighting again the same. At a sequencing level, we have And we can see that across the specific clone as well, clone 520, which is this And of course, our glutamatergic neurons are pure, are roughly higher than 80% of glutamatergic with 50% glucolinergic markers. And they express the key markers of the glut one that So at the bio, we're trying to or aiming to make every cell available in the body. So we can use this for cell therapy applications and off-the-shelf research product, products as well. And we aim to overcome some of the hurdles faced with research drug discovery and allergenic cell therapy through some scalability. We have consistency that we highlight at a functional level, a sequencing level, and a phenotypic level. Defined because we can show that our cells are functional and quick. We can generate our cell types within days. Um, so that that is the end of the talk, and um, we're hoping to have our presentation for what we can generate as a bio. And any questions?